Well, as we come to Romans chapter 5, we enter an awkward stage. As you know, we're not going to go all the way through Romans, but we're going to put a pen here, go back to Genesis, complete Genesis, and then come back to Romans again. And there's just no easy place to put a pen here in Romans. And the way we have it scheduled, we, we put a pen at the end of chapter 5. But chapter 5 is actually the beginning of a new section. Chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 uh, form this sort of second movement, if you will, in the book of Romans. In these first four chapters, in this first movement, we've seen this picture of justification by faith. Now we see some of the blessings that are inherent to us as a result of this justification. Listen to the way that Tom Schreiner puts this in his commentary on the book of Romans. He says, chapters 1 through 4 emphasize that God has fulfilled his saving promise through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who put their faith in him are in the right before God. Now in chapters 5 through 8, Paul ties together righteousness by faith with future hope. The Old Testament scriptures emphasize repeatedly the future hope of Israel and the promises for future salvation. Paul argues in Romans 5 through 8 that those who are right with God are the inheritors of the future promises made to Israel. Since these promises are theirs, the new people of God have an unshakable hope. They can look forward with confidence to a renewed creation in which they will fulfill the role of ruling over the world that Adam squandered when he sinned. So God has made promises, and those promises are real. If we are heirs of the promise by faith, not, not by our, our lineage connecting us to Abraham, but by faith, and Abraham therefore being the father of the faithful, we are connected to those promises that God has made. We look forward with anxious anticipation to those promises being fulfilled. Now that raises another question, and that question is, well, does that mean that God has forsaken his promise that he made to the nation of Israel? Well, without going too far into that, let me say that chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the book of Romans actually deal with that. And the purpose of chapters 9, 10, and 11 is to basically say, lest you think that God is one who goes about breaking his promises, therefore making himself a God who cannot be trusted, look here at the picture of what God has done, is doing, with the promise that he made to Israel. So, that question is answered in chapters 9 and 10 and 11. But here, we're in the middle section, chapters 5 through 8, looking at the promises that accrue to us because we come to God through faith just as Abraham did and are thereby heirs to those eschatological promises, those future promises, as well as other promises that we shall see. Now, in chapters 5 through 8, here's what Paul does. In, in chapters 5 through 8, read like a good speech or a good essay. And those who have had to write speech or had to give speeches or write essays, you, 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 know, you know the pattern. You know what I'm about to say. What do we do? Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And then tell them what you told them. Right? Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And then tell them what you told them. Well, here in chapter 5, we begin with, tell them what you're going to tell them. Then we will continue on with, tell them. And then in chapter 8, we get, tell them what you told them. You'll see that more as we go through this introductory paragraph this morning. We'll spend a little more time um, unfolding some of chapter 8 because we're going to take a break before we come back. So it'll still be fresh. By the time we get to chapter 8, because there will be several months between today and the time that we actually get to that chapter. But it's very important that we see the way this fits together. As Paul tells us what he's going to tell us here in this first paragraph, and then goes on to tell us, and then in chapter 8, in the culmination of this middle section, before getting into that section 9 through 11, he reiterates and tells us what he has told us. With that in mind, let's begin in Romans chapter 5, and turn the corner 
Now that we understand what it means to be justified by faith, let's look at the benefits that accrue to those who are justified by faith. Therefore, what's that therefore? Therefore, chapters 1 through 4 is the therefore, that that therefore is therefore. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, he also identifies his audience here. This is very important as we go through this letter. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. So, is Paul writing the book of Romans as though he were writing to convince non-believers to become believers? No, no, he's not. Paul is actually writing the book of Romans to the church in Rome, to believers who are Jews and Gentiles, at this time increasingly more Jew than Gentile, but he is writing it to believers. So as we continue through this, it's very important that we understand that distinction. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Notice the picture there of the Trinity. We start with the peace that we have with God the Father. Our access to the peace that we have with God the Father is through the blood that is shed by God the Son. By the way, the way this works itself out in our lives is through the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by whom? God the Holy Spirit. So we see the Trinitarian work of God not only in saving sinners, but we see the Trinitarian work of God and the benefits that accrue to those who are justified by faith. Several truths here. The first benefit that we see is hope. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, or peace rather, I'm sorry, I said hope, it should have said peace. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the first benefit. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this so important? It's important for a number of reasons. Turn back with me, if you will, to chapter 1 and verse 7. After Paul introduces himself, he introduces another thing. He says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come with me to chapter 1 again and look at verse 7. 18. There's something else. He introduces that idea of peace in his introduction of his letter to his audience. However, in order for them to understand that peace, they have to understand another truth and another reality. That's introduced in verse 18. For, go to verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He goes on from verse 18 to demonstrate that this unrighteousness that suppresses the truth is present in both Jew and Greek. The Greek first in this first part, and then he gets in chapter 2 to the Jew. So now we stand under condemnation and the expectation of the wrath of God for all men, for all flesh. So for the Gentile who is out there without the law, his expectation is the wrath of God. For the Jew who has the law but does not keep the law, which is every Jew with the law, his expectation is the wrath of God. 
Therefore, Paul makes his argument, comes to the end of chapter 3, and then in chapter 4, that justification has to be by faith, that Abraham is our example of justification by faith. Abraham is justified by faith before he is circumcised and before there's ever a law. By the way, that's good news. Why? Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, before we're justified by faith, all of us have hope of one thing, and that is wrath. Every one of us, the wrath of God that is to come. Whatever you're trusting in, if you're trusting in your own inherent goodness, what you can expect is the wrath of God that is to come. If you are trusting in your ability to keep the law before a holy God, your only expectation is the wrath of God that is to come. However, because we are justified by faith, we have access to something other than the wrath of God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That last phrase is important. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have access to peace with God. By the way, this peace is both an eschatological peace in that ultimately I will be at peace with God, made at one with God, but also a temporal peace in the right here and the right now. It is an objective peace and a subjective peace. It is real peace. Listen to this from Everett Harrison. The first of the blessings conveyed by justification is peace. We have encountered the word in the salutation, chapter 1, verse 7, and in an eschatological setting, chapter 2, verse 10. Here, however, the milieu is the estrangement between God and man because of sin. I have peace with God in spite of my sin. I can't have it any other way other than through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way I have peace with God. Objective peace, subjective peace. Let me explain the difference between the two. Uh, objectively, we know that we have peace because of that declaration. This is that time of year between May and September where, again, if you are an, a, an aware citizen, if you are one who continues to remember and does not forget, then you remember VE Day and VJ Day. Amen? Victory in Europe Day and Victory in Japan Day. To what does that refer? That refers to the supposed war to end all wars. That refers to the Second World War. This war in which we were all embroiled. There was victory in Europe, and then a few months later there is victory in Japan, and the war is over. I, I actually, we had the privilege of standing on the ship where the Japanese surrendered. It's there docked in Pearl Harbor. And we stand on the ship and you can see the video and hear all the interesting facts about that day when they came aboard and signed uh, this, this treaty. Well, at that point, when there is a signature on a treaty, you have objective peace. Objective peace means the war is over. However, there is a difference between objective peace and subjective peace. Objective peace, the war is over. However... Immediately upon having that objective peace, you don't immediately start sitting down to dinner and sort of lie, laughing and smiling over what happened in the past. No, for a while, things still smart. Amen? But slowly but surely, over time, what came both in Europe and in Japan was not just objective peace, which says we're no longer at war, but subjective peace, which says we can be partners and friends. See, as believers, on the one hand, we have objective peace with God, which means that there is this declaration of peace. But there is also the outworking of that objective peace in my life, subjectively, wherein my relationship with God is one of peace. However, you and I both know that there are times when that subjective peace is interrupted. And I just don't feel like I'm at peace with God. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One thing that causes us not to feel like we have peace with God is when we're continuing in sin. Amen? I have peace with God. 
Now, why do I need peace with God? Well, because God's wrath was against me. Why was God's wrath against me? God's wrath was against me because of sin. Okay, but Christ died for my sin. So now I have that objective peace with God. But wait a minute, what is this that you're walking in? Well, it's sin. Well, wait a minute. I thought that the wrath of God was against you because of that stuff. Well, it was, but Jesus died for it, so now I'm walking in it so that I can really enjoy the peace that... See how that doesn't work? See, as believers, when we sin, it interrupts that subjective peace. And we recognize that that ought not to be so. That is one of the great blessings that is ours as a result of coming to God and being justified by faith. We have this peace with God that is not just objective, but subjective, so that when we sin, it is interrupted. It bothers us. But there is another issue that will interrupt that subjective peace. And that's when we ignore that last phrase. I have peace with God through what? Through the finished work of Jesus Christ. How do I interrupt that? When I, as a believer, begin to define my peace with God through anything other than the finished work of Jesus Christ. I I have peace with God. Jesus Christ bought for me that objective peace with God. However, that subjective peace with God is actually purchased by me as I now go forward and work to earn the subjective peace with God. I have objective peace with God because of the finished work of Christ. I have subjective peace with God because I'm better than you are. If that's your mentality, you have no peace. You have no peace. Why? Because in and of yourself, you cannot have peace with God. It is only through Jesus Christ that we have both the objective and the subjective peace with God. But wait a minute. Are you saying that I ought to continue in sin? Stop that. That's chapter 6. By the way, the answer is, may it never be. Meganoita in the Greek. No, absolutely not. Nothing could be further from the truth. We don't continue in sin. However, it is not the fact that we don't continue in sin that gives us peace with God. It is actually the objective peace with God through Jesus Christ and the subjective peace with God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit of God dwelling within us that leads us to walk in righteousness as a result of our justification by faith, not as a means of our justification. I don't have peace with God when I'm trying to do in my flesh what can only be accomplished in the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's no peace there. There's no peace there. And all I have is a continued cycle. And it goes something like this. I make a commitment to work harder. And I do better for a while. And then I don't. And then I feel guilty. And then I make another commitment to God to do better. And I do better for a while. And then I don't. And then I feel guilty. And then I make another commitment to God to do better. And I do better for a while. And then I don't. Stop me when you've heard this before. Amen. That's the life that is attempting to attain the subjective peace with God through human effort. Not recognizing that the peace that I have with God is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the first benefit that accrues to the believer as a result of justification by faith. Here's the irony. The irony is, Paul just said the reason that we have access to peace with God is because we're no longer on the other side of the ledger where we're trying to keep the law which can never work. And what many of us do is we say, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Thank you for bringing me over here to this side of the ledger where I have peace with God. I'm so grateful that I have peace with God. Where are you going? Back to the other side of the ledger so that I can maintain it. You can't get there from here. 
our peace with God, objective and subjective, is through Christ. The person and work of Jesus Christ and that alone. And again, I know we always love for the other shoe to drop, you know. And the other shoe to drop means that, you know, that that doesn't mean you can't live any way you want to. And you have to live like this, 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 this. No, we're not talking about that today. Just be uncomfortable with the subjective peace of God that is yours through Christ and Him alone. Not Christ and, not Christ plus, but Christ and Him alone. Yes, but I want to do something. That's right. Kill that. Don't let it die. Don't watch it die. Kill it. That thing in you that wants to help God out, destroy it before it destroys you. The peace that you have with God is won by Christ. He is our victor. He is our substitute. And He is our peace. Him and Him alone. But there's another benefit, as though that's not enough. Verse 2, Through Him we have also obtained... Just that... Just... I have peace with God. Amen. Just stop right there, Paul. No. So it's sort of like the TV sales guys. But wait, there's more. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So not only do I have peace, but I have access. In the Greek, the phrase there is, we've obtained an introduction. It's almost as though this is an expansion on that subjective peace. Not only, am, not only am I in right standing with God, but I'm in right relationship with God. I have access. By this grace in which I stand, I have access. I come boldly, as the author of Hebrews says, before the throne of grace. I have access to do that. How dare I enter boldly before the presence of Almighty God with all of the baggage in my past? How dare I? I'll tell you how dare I. I have access. That's how. Through Christ and His blood shed for me on the cross, I have access. Peace with God and access to God by grace through faith. He is my God. And I am His child. Not, not, not only do I have this one day somewhere way down in the future access to God. But I have right here, right now, all day, every day access to God. And I don't need another mediator for that access to God. I have access to God by virtue of my justification by faith. There is not another mediator who stands between me and God. As though on the one hand, Jesus provides for me this peace with God. And on the other hand, if I want access, I need Jesus and another mediator. Be that Mary or a priest or you, you, whomever. There is no other mediator. One mediator between God and man. And that is the man Christ Jesus. I have access by Him. I have access by grace. Is this access earned? Yes. But again, not by me. Through the blood of His cross. Listen to this from John Calvin. And by the word stand, he means... That faith is not a changeable persuasion only for one day, but that it is immutable and that it sinks deep into the heart so that it endures through life. It is then not he who by a sudden impulse is led to believe that has faith and is to be reckoned among the faithful, but he who constantly and so to speak with a firm and fixed foot abides in that station appointed to him by God so as to cleave 
always to Christ. Amen. Who is my access? Christ is my access. Who is my peace? Christ is my peace. And again, this is only true because of the work that we've done, working all the way through chapter 1, all the way through chapter 3, and then looking at Abraham as our example in chapter 4 of justification by faith. I have peace, and I have access. God is my God. There's a final piece here, though. We also have hope. Look at the next part of the passage. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. As a result of that, there are two things that happen. One, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And secondly, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, remember I told you that we were going to have to do a little work in chapter 8 in order to get this. This is, tell them what you're going to tell them. After this, we move into tell them. And then in chapter 8, we move into tell them what you told them. So here's what we need to understand. There's a picture here of exalting in hope of the glory of God. That exaltation in hope of the glory of God is exalting in the hope of the glory that is to come. It, again, is an eschatological hope. There is a glory that will be ours. We have not yet attained it. However, it is real. It's that picture of us being seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That is the hope in which we exalt. The other side of that coin, however, is our sufferings. Now note what Paul is saying here. He's saying that the opposite of that hope that will one day be attained by us is the suffering that happens between now and then. So when he says suffering, he doesn't just mean a bad day here and there. He means the totality of your life. All of it. Once you get a hold of what one day shall be ours in fullness. How can you call the rest of your life anything but suffering until that moment? Amen? But listen to the picture that he paints here in chapter 8. Go to chapter 8. And look beginning at verse 16. This is, tell them what you told them. We exalt and hope the glory of God. Verse 17, chapter 8, or 16, rather. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. There's the picture. Glory and suffering. It goes on. Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. There it is again. Suffering versus glory. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There it is again. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly. We wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he has seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's telling what you told them. What do you mean in Romans chapter 5, Paul? Read it in Romans chapter 8. That's what I mean. So let's unpack this in light of what we see in Romans chapter 8. So first we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Now remember what happened in Romans chapter 1. Go with me again to Romans chapter 1. And look at what man did in his ignorance. We read verses 16 through 19, start at verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish heart were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So on the other side of the ledger, apart from faith, what were the Gentiles guilty of? Exchanging the glory of God for some other glory. But now, in justification by faith, we have peace with God, access to God, and we also now, instead of exalting in our own glory or the glory of created things, we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Why? Because before I was trusting in myself and what I could do. Now I'm trusting in God, God the Father, whose wrath has been assuaged by God the Son and God the Spirit who appropriates that in my life. So salvation from the beginning to the end is the work of the triune God. So my ultimate hope is what? In the glory of Almighty God and not my own. But the minute I start to believe that my subjective peace with God is based on my own works, what am I doing? I'm setting up a situation where if I follow it through to its logical conclusion... I'm going to stand before God one day and share in His glory. May it never be. Though do you stand before me today justified? Jesus, I want to thank you for the part that you did in Vody's justification. But Vody, we also need to thank you for what you brought to the table. Because I'm telling you, you worked really hard and added to the sacrifice that my sa- that is perverse. But you know what? I'm guilty of it every time I look to myself for justification. Every time I look to myself for righteousness. Every time I look to me for hope. Every time I look to me in comparison to others or whatever. Every time I do that, in my mind, I'm setting up that moment where I may share in the glory of God. But when I understand that it is my God who has saved me from beginning to end, and that even the works that I do, we get into that in chapter 6 and chapter 7 and in chapter 8 specifically, but even the works that I do, I recognize that it is Him who works in me both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So that when I accomplish something, my response is not, look at how good I've done. But my accomplishments all turn back to God in praise because it is God who saves me and sanctifies me and will ultimately glorify me. So I exult completely and totally in the hope of the glory of Almighty God, not my own. It's His. And in that I can boast. We know boasting is wrong throughout the scriptures. But listen to this, 2 Corinthians 10, 17. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Galatians 6, 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Galatians, uh, repetition of that passage. But again, where is boasting? My boasting's in the Lord. My boasting is in what God has done. My boasting is in what God has accomplished. My boasting is in God working out what He began in me and seeing it through to completion, not myself. So I I boast in that. It, It is to come, but it's not here yet. So what about in the meantime? As a believer, do I only sit here and boast about what is to come as though my current life is some sort of mystery or or my current life is some sort of non-reality no not at all notice what he also says look in chapter 5 again at verse 3 more than that we rejoice in our sufferings again in chapter 8 he spells this out suffering and glory those things going hand to hand by the way christ when we talk about his incarnation what do we talk about we talk about his humiliation and his exaltation. And in a way, this is sort of a microcosm of that. We boast not only in our exaltation, but also in our humiliation. As Christ experienced both humiliation and exaltation. So we boast even, we exalt even in our sufferings. 
Now, uh, mind you, here's what this doesn't mean. Something bad happens, and we go, Woo-hoo-hoo! I like that. That was awful. <laughs> I love awful. That, that's not what's meant here. It, it's not a sort of, thank you, sir, may I have another approach to life. But he explains what he means. Knowing. Why do we boast in our, rejoice in our sufferings or exult in our sufferings? Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put to shame. We have many young people in this church who play piano. Some who actually like it. They've endured and they've pressed beyond. But but here's what happens. You start playing piano and you begin to play the piano and you have to do all these little finger exercises and you're playing these scales and you're playing these notes and over and over and over again. An hour every day, an hour every day. All of a sudden, what, what begins to happen? Well, that suffering that you endure begins to produce endurance. Now it doesn't hurt like it used to for me to do this. But my suffering has produced something. Well, beyond that, what begins to happen? Well, endurance produces a character or proven character. So now I am proficient. And what does that character produce? It produces hope. Hope in what? You know, there are other things that I can play that are out there that I never thought that I can play. Why do I believe now that I can play them? Well, because I started with the suffering. The suffering produced endurance. The endurance produced character. And that character produced hope. As a believer, this sanctification process is very similar. As a believer, there is suffering that we endure. There are things that we go through that are not pleasant in our lives. There are things that we go through that we don't necessarily enjoy. Sometimes as a believer, there are things that we were accustomed to that are no longer available to us. And it's difficult. You know, one of the things that makes me cringe is sometimes people will stand up and they'll share their testimony and they'll say something like this. Well, you know, before I was a Christian, I was an alcoholic. And then I got saved. And when I got saved, God immediately, just like that, took away the taste of alcohol from my mouth. I never wanted it anymore. I never looked at it again. I never, when I hear that testimony, I cringe. I cringe for two reasons. One, because it's usually not true. Amen. That's usually revisionist history. It's usually not true when you hear that testimony. Has it happened? Yes, it's happened, but that's usually not true. Here's number two. That's not the normal way believers are sanctified. It's not. I was converted and the next day, all those sinful desires were gone. No, no, no. I was converted and the next day, the war began. And I suffered. But by the grace of Almighty God, that produced endurance. And by the grace of Almighty God, that produced a proven character. And by the grace of Almighty God, that eventually produced hope. Hope in what? Hope in God, because He is actually sanctifying me, and I'm seeing His sanctifying work work itself out in my life. Which is the other reason that I cringe when I hear that testimony. If I come to Christ and all of a sudden there's one particular area in my life where, bam, the next day it's over, what is that going to produce in me as it relates to the other areas in my life where this process is more the reality? Well, now something's wrong. What's wrong? Well, I'm I'm struggling with lust. Okay, struggle. Well, no, see, you don't understand. I used to be an alcoholic. And on the day that I got saved, bam, that was taken away from me. But this wasn't taken away from me. Do you see my point? 
Well, I, I hate to break it to you, but that bam, this was taken away from me, not normal. Not the way the process of sanctification works. Praise God for it. That by his grace, by his mercy, in his providence, for whatever reason, he removed that from you so that he could continue you on down the path. But know this, that is not the way the Christian life is lived out. You don't get saved one day and sanctified the next. Amen. What happens is, as a result of your justification by faith, you are able to exalt even in your sufferings because they produce endurance. And that endurance produces character. And that character produces hope. By the way, it's not an empty hope. What kind of hope is it? I'm glad you asked. And hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because we hope real hard? No. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Folks, my hope is not in hope, just like my faith was not in faith. What's my hope in? In the active work of the third person of the Trinity in my life as a follower of Christ who's been justified by faith. I'm His. He's mine. And the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead has shed abroad, has poured out, has overflowed the love of God into my heart so that as I suffer and it produces endurance, and as I endure and it produces character, and as that character produces hope, my hope doesn't put me to shame. Why? Because of God. Not because I did the process better than others, but because of God. Because of the third person of the Trinity. Turn with me again to Romans chapter 8. Remember, tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And then tell them what you told them. We've seen in Romans chapter 8 this interplay between glory and suffering. And this hope that is ours. We've also seen the third person of the Trinity in this interplay. Look with me if you will. Now at verse 26 where we left off. Likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit, what, uh, excuse me, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I, I don't even know what I need from God, but that's okay. The Spirit of the living God abides in me and intercedes for me in accordance with the will of God. Verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. In order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. From beginning to end, who's in charge of the process? God. God. Then there's that great question. <laughs> so what, what is it that can separate us from the love of God? What suffering is there that I can suffer that is enough for my suffering to separate me from God? Paul answers the question in Romans chapter 8. Nothing. Height. Depth. Things present, things to come, but what, what is it? You name it and the answer is nothing. That's my hope. That's where my hope lies. My hope doesn't lie in, in, in somehow not having to go through the process of sanctification. That's not where my hope lies. And sometimes that's where we get. What's wrong with you? Oh, man, I'm just struggling, and I'm sick and tired of struggling. Well, good for you. 
By the way, we're going to get there too in Romans chapter 7. Amen. I'm struggling and I'm sick and tired of struggling. Welcome to the Christian life. Now, when you worry is when you're not struggling. Amen. Because here's what I know. When you stop struggling, it will not be because you have reached perfection. When you stop struggling, it will be because you've given in and you're no longer fighting that thing that you should fight tooth and nail until fighting is over. And that peace is finalized when we're glorified. So in the meantime, and in between time, you struggle. Amen. But where's my hope? Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not disappoint. Why? Because of the Spirit of the living God who has sealed us, who abides in us, who sheds abroad in our hearts the love of Almighty God, who will bring these things to pass. That's why. You hope in the struggle in spite of the struggle because you know the one who is victorious in the end. And he's God. So you endure. And you endure today until today becomes tomorrow. And then what do you do tomorrow? You endure tomorrow until tomorrow becomes the next day. And the next, and the next, and the next. But there will come a day when those who have been foreknown and predestined and called and justified and sanctified will ultimately be glorified. In the meantime and in between time, don't, don't forget what Paul says. Remember his words, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now, that's different than, hang in there, it's going to get better. Amen? That is, hang in there, regardless of whether it gets better or not. Hang in there, it's going to get better, means that ultimately our hope is for the here and the now. Hang in there, whether it gets better or not, means ultimately our hope is in Christ. And He's interceding for us. And our glorification is yet to come. The sanctification process will continue for the rest of your life. Somebody said something uh, it, it was either last week or the week before, and it just it just resonated with me. We're sitting down at lunch, and he said, you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to chapter 4, and I'm listening to the messages about Abraham, and, and he, God just gave me just overwhelming joy in this little fact. Abraham was a 100 years old when this was going on. 100 years old. Some of y'all are still going, okay, and? Here's the and. I stand here before you, 41 years old. That means I have hope that should the Lord tarry and I live 59 more years, I'll still be growing and learning how to trust God. That's just good. That's just good. Whoever you are, some of you need to hear that because you're sitting here and you're going, I've been walking with Christ for 20 years, 30 years, however many years, and I'm still struggling. When am I going to get it right? Have you read your Bible? Have you forgotten? Don't ever forget. This struggle lasts until you die. Amen. Then it's over. Between now and then, we fight. And our suffering produces endurance, and our endurance 
Proven character and proven character. Hope. Hope and hope. No, not hope and hope. A hope that will not disappoint because our hope is in the one who is the author and finisher of our faith. That's our hope. So what's so good about being a Christian? Here it is. We have peace with God. We have access to God. And we have hope. And none of these things exist apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ. Show me a person without Jesus, and I'll show you a person who doesn't have peace with God. Show me a person without Jesus, and I'll show you a person that doesn't have access. Show me a person without Jesus, and I will show you a person without hope. The most positive thinking, smiling, outlook on life person that you've ever met in your life. If that person is without Christ, they are without hope in the world. These are the blessings. Just the tip of the iceberg of the blessings that accrue to us. That's a direct result of our justification by faith. We have access to peace with God. We have access to God Himself. And we have hope. And if you are here today and you find yourself without these things, that's because you're without Christ in the world. That's because you're trusting in the wrong thing. So if you sit here today and you say, you know what, I don't have peace with God. I I, I just don't. I can't find peace with God. The answer is you need Christ. Come to Him in repentance and faith. If you sit here today and you say, not only do I not have peace with God, I don't even have access to God. I wouldn't even know how to approach God. I believe when I open my mouth to God, my words don't go past the ceiling. If you don't have access, then you sit here without hope in the world, without Christ, and you need Him. Come to Him in repentance and faith. If you're here and you don't have hope, or all you have is hope and hope, then what you desperately need is Christ. If you sit here and you wonder if all of the work that you are doing in trying to be a better person than your neighbor or the guy you hear about on the news who does terrible things, if that's your only hope and that someday you're going to stand before God and all you're going to have is, I was a good man, I was a good woman, I was a good husband, I was a good wife, I was a good mother, I was a good father, I was a good businessman, I was better than most people. If that's all you've got, then do not leave here today without doing business with God because that is woefully insufficient. And all you have hope of is the wrath that is to come. Turn from that and turn to your only hope, which is the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is your only access to peace with God. He is your only access to God. And He is your only source of hope in this world and in the world that is to come. Why on earth would you tarry? Let go of whatever it is that is in your hand. And say with the hymn writer, nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. And say again, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And unless and until that is you here today, you are without Christ in the world. You are without hope in the world. And I beseech you, come to Him by faith. Turn from your sin. Turn toward Christ. Believe on Him and Him alone for your salvation. And be made new. Be made whole. Does that mean that tomorrow you're going to lose the taste for whatever it is that you have a taste for? Probably not. 
But whatever struggle ensues, I guarantee you, is not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Would you bow with me? Listen to these words from James Edwards. It's one thing to be a Christian with the wind at one's back. How frequently the Christian life is depicted as a state of insulation and ease, where believers are supposedly endowed with some sort of executive clemency from the knocks of life. Increasingly in our day, Christian life is depicted in terms of triumphalism and success. Paul, however, says that the believer must learn to rejoice not only in the future hope of glory, but also in our sufferings. As we bow, I don't know what sufferings it is or there are that you're enduring, but I know that you are. And that as you endure those sufferings, There are two possibilities. Possibility number one is that you cling to Christ as your only hope. Possibility number two is that you cling to something else and ultimately end up with no hope at all. Would you today lay your sufferings at the foot of the cross? Not in hopes that in doing so, you will suffer no more. But in hopes that in doing so, you will be reminded of where the power lay. Not in you, but in Him. And when you've done so, 